Great to see everyone. So let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our, our Respect Her Game panel. In case you're wondering what Respect Her Game is, it is a campaign that was launched by the Representation Project in order to raise awareness about intersectional gendered coverage uh, of women athletes, specifically with a focus right now on the Olympics. Uh, my name is Dr. Caroline Heldman and I'm the Executive Director of the Representation Project. Uh, we use media in order to fight sexism, including social media campaigns around intersectional sexism. And we are going to start off the program today um, with a uh, very, very brief presentation of some really interesting data. Um, we just published a study, as in one minute ago, um, we just published a study um, on our website, so uh, pertaining to Olympic coverage. And so I wanna share the results of that. You will also receive it in your email and you can go to our website right now and look at this data. So uh, just to set the tone of what we have seen for the first week of Olympics coverage, um, let's just jump right in here. Our study had uh, two types of content analysis. The first is uh, automated coding. So we used some algorithms in order to uh, identify faces and detect and classify. Um, I will say during the first week of competition, um, we analyzed uh, men athletes and women athletes. There were no gender non-conforming athletes um, officially listed until this week, which is right outside of the purview of our research, but important to note. Um, we also had six researchers who analyzed uh, 24 hours of content, and this is primetime coverage, and that included 1,052 Olympic competitors, commentators, reporters, or interviewers, and then uh, non-competing interviewees. And again, this is for the first week of Olympic coverage, uh, and we were curious as to whether or not we would find a lot of the same sexism that we have found for a very long time with women athletes, a focus on their bodies, sexualization, a focus on whether they're married or unmarried, attributing their success to the men in their lives, whether it's their fathers or their coaches much more than male athletes get that attribution. Um, also, you know, a focus on emotionality and as opposed uh, to, and, and I'm sure this will come up in this panel, um, as opposed to treating them like athletes, right? Othering them. So for example, instead of calling them athletes, calling them women athletes, or uh, using gender diminutive terms like girls. So what did we find? Well, here are our big findings. The first is a very positive finding. Um, and it actually mirrors what we found in the past two Summer Olympics. So we find that women receive 59.1% of screen time. So Anytime there's a face on the screen, that was our, our uh, denominator if you're into the stats part of things. So we found that uh, women actually uh, were very well represented in terms of presence. Uh, especially compared to the global baseline, which is just around 50% women. Um, however, uh, some of the more negative findings, eight in 10 Olympic commentators are men. That is a huge gap uh, in, in 2021. Uh, two thirds of athletes uh, wear revealing clothing, uh, women athletes compared to half of men. So, uh, you know, wearing revealing outfits is, is oftentimes a part of the sport. Uh, but we find it's much more a part of the sport when we're talking about women athletes and when we're talking about men athletes. And then something that we can control, which is the angle of cameras and panning up and down bodies. Uh, we found that women athletes are about 10 times more likely to be vis uh, visually sexually objectified with camera angles than male athletes. And then that idea of you know uh, male athletes being referred to as athletes by and large, almost 100% of the time, um, whereas uh, women athletes are often referred to as that, right, or women swimmers. Um, so 13.6% of the time compared to just 2% of the time for men. Um, we also found uh, that women athletes are seven times more likely to be referred to using a gender diminutive, specifically girls, um, ladies, and if you're wondering who used the term chicks, um, that was Michael Phelps a couple times. Um, so action steps. Uh, for media executives and for Olympic executives. Media executives, you know, hire more women commentators. Um, talk about camera angles and how, you know, make sure that 
the folks uh, who are, are providing your footage um, have a directive that they need to focus on the athletes and not sexualize their bodies using camera angles. Also, the idea of referring to athletes as athletes uh, without qualifying that uh, in terms of men or women. And then, of course, avoiding like openly sexist, uh, diminutive language. And then for Olympic executives, and this I'm sure will come up in this panel as well, um, instead of mandating sexually revealing outfits, let folks wear what they want. So uh, we are starting off um, our panel in style, um, and I just, in, in terms of providing a little data and background, um, and I just jumped off of this, but I want you to see our fantastic panel. Um, we have uh, some of the top thinkers uh, in the world right now sitting on your screen. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about who each of these people are um, and then jump right into some questions. Um, Dr. Courtney Cox uh, is an expert at the University of Oregon and her research has uh, focuses uh, on many different intersections, including a global look at that, at this issue. Uh, Miran Fader is uh, from The Ringer and their, their full bios um, will be in, in links. Uh, but Miran Fader uh, has a, hopefully, a New York Times bestseller, I don't want to jinx it, a great book coming out on uh, Dionis. Um, we have Dr. Sean Anderson, who focuses on corporate social responsibility, um, specifically um, with a focus on um, athletes and what obligation they have when it comes to um, speaking out politically. That will also be coming up uh, quite a bit, I think, on this panel. Uh, Soraya Jacardi is a senior researcher at the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center, and she has been working in this field for a very long time, looking at representations in media. She was the uh, associate research director at the Gina Davis Institute um, and has collaborated with lots of nonprofits around this work. And Mackenzie Thomas, uh, sits, her work sits at the intersection of technology and civic engagement. She has worked at Google for nearly a decade and uh, and I just want to read this quote from her bio, relentless advocate for marginalized communities and the development of core products and community-wide initiatives currently focusing on COVID-19 relief. So um, welcome panel. Um, I, as you know, I presented some findings in the program that women have made progress in terms of the amount of coverage in sports, at least in, in terms of the Olympics, but that sexism persists in the type of coverage they receive. Uh, so Let's just start with a question for the entire panel. Uh, what are the most notable examples of intersectional sexism, sexism in sports coverage that you have seen and why is this such a persistent problem? Um, let's start with you, uh, Dr. Anderson. Oh, uh, sure, so thank you for having me here on this uh, great panel. Uh, and, and you know, for that, that question, I, I think you can see many angles from, from their perspective. And so for me, I, I look at things from sort of the organizational lens and sort of how we have those disparities that, that uh, we see. And, and to kind of answer that question, I can say easily there, there are a couple of things. Um, when we see, for example, the, the enormous pay gap between NBA players and the WNBA, for example, right? But we also see that the WNBA has a uh, staunch, powerful record of engaging in activism, you know, and to say that some of them, uh, some of the members of, of that organization sort of carried the movement after uh, Colin Kaepernick made his stance. And so that can be uh, something that is uh, very much, again, a disparity there. Um, also, uh, we can look at the fact that uh, when it comes to the NCAA and the past March Madness when uh, the, the basketball teams basically had to call out the NCAA for not having the proper equipment for the women athletes versus the men. And so again, you know, those are some of the things that, that we see sort of from this organizational level, level that have been covered in the media that needs to really be fixed moving forward. Yeah, thank you for that systemic analysis. Um, Soraya, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, well, just like was mentioned, um, 
it's almost hard to narrow down what examples, um, you know, come to mind, especially because we've seen so many examples just in the last few weeks with the Tokyo Olympics alone. Um, you know, I, you know, thinking back, not just to, to the Olympics, but just in general, some of the, some of the instances that really stand out to me, um, a lot of them revolve around Serena Williams. You know, and I think about a few years back when Serena Williams, you know, played wearing a black cat suit. It was a tight fitting bodysuit that helped with blood circulation issues. At this point, Serena Williams had been pretty open about some of the complications she had faced during childbirth. So this this outfit that she picked had health implications and health benefits. And there was a tremendous amount of backslash. Uh, about, about this outfit that she chose, you know, French Tennis Federation president said that one must respect the game and the place, right? Implying that Serena Williams was not respecting the game or the place by, um, by using that outfit. And that actually resulted in a lot of backlash and the creation of an entirely new dress code that hadn't previously been um, enforced. So moving, moving on past that, Serena Williams was not able to wear that cat suit again. Um, I also think about, you know, a few years ago when uh, a female French tennis player, she she was sweaty, right? During a long, hot game, she changes her shirt and realizes that it's on backwards. So she takes it off really quickly on the court and turns it around. And she received a dress code violation for changing her shirt on the court. Um, and during that same period of time, there was a, a male player who changed his shirt. Somebody counted a total of 11 times during the game. Um, and he did not receive a dress code violation. Um, during that same period of time, we also saw um, tennis player Novak Djorovic, whose name I might be totally butchering, and I apologize for that, but he actually sat shirtless on the court for a few minutes during the game. He also didn't just receive a dress um, code violation. Um, so it, it, so many of these instances that really stand out to me end up coming down to a focus on what women were wearing, what, what they were wearing um, during the game, rather than what they were accomplishing. Thank you, Soraya. Um, Dr. Cox, what is your analysis and maybe some examples of why this is such a persistent problem? Yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of my thoughts kind of align with what's been said already, but maybe more broadly, just kind of the regulation of bodies. And when we think about the Olympics, as this highly visible global site, um, it becomes that much important for all the issues that have already been brought up. And so this broader understanding of regulating bodies, whether we're going back to FIFA and FIBA's ban on the hijab, for example, um, where we're thinking about Castro Semenya, or even this year, the Namibian runners who are subjected to not only very embarrassing, painful testing protocols, but also the way that that's mediated as well. So this determination from the IOC down to governing bodies on who can play and, and what they have to look like as they play right and so there's that and then you know one of the biggest things that will continue to be an issue as we continue to see this is gendered violence against athletes whether it's on behalf of doctors coaches or other athletes right and so i think um athletes as, as both perpetrating violence against uh women um as, as well as thinking about how these things are litigated how these things are taken up and how governing bodies respond to these forms of violence in terms of making sports safe so we always talk about making sport fair making it safe um, and so I think one of the biggest issues that will continue to be that in USA gymnastics is a huge example right but there's so many other examples we can point to um, from down to youth sports all the way up to the pros in terms of thinking about um, abuses and violence that continue to kind of wreak havoc on the sport as well as the athletes that enter into those spaces. Mm, thank you Dr. Cox. Um, Miriam, what are your thoughts on this, the persistence of, of sexism, intersectional sexism, and examples you may have witnessed or covered over the years? Yeah, I mean, look at the recent discourse on Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, you know, it's, it's so clear whether, you know, I know we've just talked about Serena, but whenever there is not just a woman athlete, but a woman athlete of color, particularly Black women, they're policed in ways that, you know, white women athletes aren't. And, you know, you see that in the way that the language that's discussed in the articles, the photos chosen when talking about Simone Biles, they're choosing, 
unflattering photos where the woman athlete of color has her mouth open, is looking upset. Um, these are strategic choices by news outlets that not only are unfair, but they do a disservice to actually capture the stories that Black women are trying to tell. And I think it starts with gatekeeping in terms of, you know, the editors that are making these choices and the reporters that are given press passes and all the way up top to the executives that make these choices. So if most of these people are white men, they are not making editorial decisions with people of color and particularly black women in mind. So it is no surprise that we see this kind of sexism just jumping out at every opportunity. And, you know, women athletes are always described in this kind of patriarchal way, this patronizing way that cast them as spoiled or ungrateful or, you know, like children and it, it denies them agency. And so you can see that sexism everywhere you go. Um, it's a huge, huge problem. And it just persists because I feel like we talk about it on Twitter and people point out how ridiculous this coverage is. And then it doesn't change because we don't have new editors, we don't have new writers, we don't have new executives. So the people who are making these choices are largely staying the same, which is not diverse. And, and that's why the coverage is the way that it is. Yeah, great systemic critiques, uh, institutional critiques of why it doesn't shift because behind the scenes matters as in terms of what you see on the screen. Uh, Mackenzie, passing it to you. Um, you've been in this space for, uh, for a while now. Uh, why is this so persistent and what are some examples you have seen of that? Sure, um, well, I think that, you know, being in the space for a while is really just more so as a as a child growing up and like really understanding this just watching I used to grow up watching ESPN every morning and um, seldom were a lot of my childhood heroes of Cheryl Swoops and Mia Hamm and Brianna Scurry on television and that kind of has been an echoing effect in in my head through time but um, you know all the other panelists have pointed out the same things that I think we all know to be true I'll just anchor on a couple other quick points of one acknowledging that oftentimes, um, you know, our women athletes are referred to in the context of their husbands, their brothers. Um, we saw this, you know, most recently with Jasmine Camacho Quinn, um, the Puerto Rican track runner. Uh, we previously saw this with Julie Ertz on the US women's soccer team, uh, constantly referred to as the husband, the brother, um, as opposed to just for the greatness that they are. And then, you know, the, the other piece there too, I think we talk about you know, and, and I think wrongly interchange female and women. Um, and that creates this like cis norm, continues and perpetuates this cis normative bias that we have. So just also want to acknowledge, you know, a lot of the hate that we've been seeing online and, you know, in, in person, in, you know, offline, in real life uh, for our trans athletes as well, who are being, you know, policed in one way or another. Um, obviously, we're seeing this with uh, Laurel Hubbard uh, and, you know, the New Zealand athlete um, weightlifter who has gotten a ton of unfortunate hate online and can't just compete as she should and as she, um, you know, should be able to. And how can we, you know, and folks who are cisgender here also echo the importance of, of our trans and gender expansive, um, you know, colleagues and athletes as well. Right. Thank you. Uh, fantastic analysis starting us off. And I just want to note that I put the extended bios in the chat, right? So I'm not just reading for 10 minutes because these are very uh, distinguished, decorated folks. So please check out their bios. Um, now we're going to jump into some, you know, one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, Soraya, talk to us about how media shapes hearts and minds. Talk to us about media impact and perhaps especially the importance of something like the Olympics, a global uh, event, right, that, that has millions of viewers tuning in from all over the world. Yeah, so there, there really is a wide body of scientific literature on this topic, um, a wide body of research that has kind of examined the power and the influence of media. And <clears throat> what this work has found, <clears throat> sorry, is that media is simply an important agent of socialization. And socialization is simply a process that we all go through, right? A process that refers to learning, how we learn how to behave in a way that's acceptable to society. 
how we learn what's normative, what is acceptable, or even what's expected of us, what's expected of others. And just like we're socialized by our parents and our schools and our religious institutions, we're also socialized by our peer groups and by media. So in fact, some media research often refers to media as being a quote unquote super peer, right? Um, highlighting the way that media can act just like, just like a peer, right? And helping us define what is cool, right? And what is interesting and what is uh, rewarded in our society. And, you know, so for example, studies have found that teenagers who consume a lot of media tend to overestimate the amount of alcohol that their peers are drinking, the amount of sex that their peers are having, the amount of kind of going out that their peers are engaging in, right? It just kind of um, distorts our perception of what is normative and what is real. Um, and media can really impact us in a in a pretty wide variety of ways, right? It can shape our expectations of others, our expectations of ourselves, beliefs and attitudes, our intentions, and even our behaviors. And I think at the most basic level, right, it can simply shape our understanding of who is worthy and who is not. Um, so there, there's a term in communication research that I like a lot, that I, that I use a lot, which is symbolic annihilation. And this simply refers to, to the ways in which we can erase an entire group of people from existence, right, by not representing them in media. And, you know, social scientists talk about symbolic an annihilation as being one of many tools that we use to preserve social inequality. So at the most basic level, it's simply, um, can just erase certain groups of people from, from our thoughts about who matters and who is important and who is worth fighting for. Thank you. Wow. In a nutshell, there it is, right? Me this is how media impacts us and especially young people, as you point out. Um, Courtney, you just following up with the theme of the importance of the Olympics, um, you've worked in sports media, you work for an NBA, WNBA team, uh, and you are now a celebrated scholar uh, on this subject. Um, tell us more about the effects and the unique role played by the Olympics on this global stage. Yeah, so kind of touching on what I, I mentioned before, the IOC and the governing bodies, whether they're the national ones or at the top of the sport, um, they create sport. Um, so they, they tell us what sport is, who it's for, and how it operates. And so when we think about something like the Olympics and the IOC specifically, they dictate citizenship, what country you belong to, what countries can be allowed in this space, who counts, right? Um, and so it's not only powerful every two years for a summer or winter Olympics, it also shapes how the sports that we play, whether it's we're thinking about youth level soccer all the way up, right? And so the things that happen at the top of the sport, the IOC, which is comprised 10% of royalty, <laughs> there's the people that are running these spaces aren't necessarily the folks that are represented on the field, rather when we think about the demographics of who's represented, right? So it matters how many women are represented, how many non-binary folks are represented in these spaces. Um, and so if you mostly have rich, white, you know, Western men that are dictating how the world sees sport, we have a lot of issues with that. Um, and so one of the things that I think about a lot is how this regulation process, what country you belong to, how you're, how you're defined as an athlete, what happens, for example, when we think about athletics, right, track and field, um, when we think about what's happening between the 400 and the mile in terms of testosterone regulation, right? Um, and so how folks are read and seen, the policies that are enforced, what one wears when you step onto uh, the field of play, all of these things are filtered through these massive events. And that's not even thinking about things like climate change, right? You know, what happens to unhoused folks when the Olympics comes to your town? All of these things factor in. And so the Olympics has such a massive reach. The only other thing that we can even start to think about um, in relation to that is the World Cup, right? Which is still restricted to one sport. And so I think one of the things that I'm reminded of every Olympic cycle is how much power sport has, um, the global reach that sport has, and thinking about um, there's lots of ways that I can think about all the terrible things that come with the Olympics, but also the ways that we're informed more than ever um, about how the world works, right? So every year I learn more about the political happenings of a country through its athletes, right? Through the protests that are on that stage, right? Rule 50 be damned, right? All the ways I 
I learned. I'm right now reading about Belarus right now, which I would not have had without having access to athletes and how they're treated within countries, right? 2016, I learned about the Oromo people in Ethiopia because of Faisa Lelesa, right? And so I think about how there is this a massive opportunity because there is so much power in this space. I think about how it allows us to question all of these things, right? To, to go back to that, that kind of symbolic annihilation. I think there's an opening that we sometimes get, right? Um, that are highly mediated, that are filtered for sure. The gatekeeping piece that Miriam brought in was so important. Um, but I think that there's something really rich about this space that allows us to inter interrogate stuff that maybe we have on the surface or we might be, you know, slightly interested in. But I think that the human element, you know, the things that tug on our heartstrings when we watch the games also allow for an opening for folks to engage in all kinds of political conversations and discourses they may not otherwise right and so there's a reason the anti-trans bills are tapping into sport there's a power in sport there right so when we think about it from a national or a global perspective i think there's a richness in sport that can allow us to to pull at these things right to pull at how sport you know reinforces a gender binary how sport in many ways is always holding black women as as other right or as as, um, as, as trouble in a particular way, right? And so I think there are these things that we know societally that are brought to the forefront um, with the Olympics, as well as other sporting uh, moments that we engage in that's are on a more regular basis. But there's something really unique about what happens within the Olympic space. And I think that's why it's so important, um, regardless of where people stand um, about it. I think there's something really rich and really important that happens in this particular space, on this particular stage. Thank you, uh, Courtney and Soraya, both of you have provided a really great comprehensive picture of how uh, the Olympics and sports coverage more broadly determine who has value, right? And how we view people uh, at a really fundamental level. And um, Courtney, you had brought up that Mirren had talked about the gatekeeping. So let's talk a little, let's dig into that now, Mirren. Um, only 11.5% of sports reporters in the United States are women. Uh, so you are a rarity. Let's uh, talk about what you have witnessed in terms of intersectional sexism in the sports newsroom and maybe not, maybe beyond just sexism, right? Other, other systems of power and oppression. And how can we get more women, especially women of color and LGBTQIA plus women into the profession? You know, it's funny when I heard that statistic, I was like, really? Because I feel like that sounds so high because I am always the only woman, no matter what locker room, you know, and it's such a strange feeling. You feel so isolated and um, and people want to kind of classify you that way. Woman journalist rather than just journalist, even though being a woman is a big part of my identity, you know, I, you don't get the same type of, I guess, respect that male journalists do. And um, there is so much gatekeeping. I mean, first of all, um, when I walk into a space, I can tell that already people doubt my knowledge of whatever sport. Um, I used to bend over backwards to try to make sure that people knew I knew what I was talking about by throwing out some obscure niche sports term because I used to be a player and, you know, I would have to do those things. And, you know, a lot of times um, the people, the handlers, the people in charge, they, again, they treat you in that same paternal way. And you're also asked to be representative of all women. So if there's something woman related, Mirren has to write. Or, you know, if if I want to write about women, which I have my whole career, I feel like um, I've had to explain way more why the woman is worthy of profiling. So for men, you can profile the sixth man, the seventh man, the guy who only ate you know, averages five points a game if he's got an interesting human story. For women, when you tell an editor you want to profile a woman athlete, she has to be like superhuman, eight Olympic medals, cooks on the side, killer badass mom, you know, side hustle. Like she has to be extraordinary to be worthy of a profile, which is obviously not fair. And the, the standards are so high in order to get that coverage. And when I pitched a story on a black trans runner, a black girl who is trans and she is a runner, it had to go all the way up to the top rung to make sure that they thought that was okay um, because they felt that story was quote risky. So um, again, like as a woman writer, you want to tell these stories, but it also shouldn't be on you to be the only person telling these stories and you have to go through hoops just to tell them. So I, I think that is really, really hard. And again, like I, 
I hate when people say, well, did you play? As if like I had to have played to know what I'm talking about. And I did play, but they still doubt that. So, um, and I know that a lot of other women face much worse. We're talking about sexual assault, rape, um, violence, just to do their jobs, just to literally report on a team. So it, there are so many hoops to go through. Um, I think it's really important, the second part of your question about how do we increase the amount of women and women of color and, and, and non-binary folks in journalism is you have to be proactive. You can't wait for someone to say, I have a job, do you know anyone? And think it's okay that you just say, yes, here's a person of color, here's a woman. You should be going to these editors that you know in your network and proactively saying, keep your eye on this person. That person is really smart and really good. If you have an opening, they'd be perfect for it. And so how do you do that? You have to get to know journalists of color and women that are younger and try to be, you know, I wouldn't say a mentor, but just try to be of help. Like, okay, yes, if there's an opportunity, I'll let you know and be proactive about telling these editors um, because they're just not looking. That's the thing. They're just not looking. There is a whole organization, NABJ, with hundreds of candidates. And when I see the job go to another white man, I'm just like, you're not looking. You're just simply not looking because organizations are there to help. Um, and then the other thing is, is that um, you have to be in charge of which panels you speak on and which opportunities you accept and ask ahead of time, who else is gonna be on the panel? Is it gonna be a diverse panel? Who, who else is part of the selection committee? So you can really um, help uh, recommend others. And, and if something is not right for you say, well, why don't you ask this person to join and, and make sure it's always a woman or a person of color. So these are small things that you can do, but for this to change, it has to be the top executive making these editorial decisions. You know, when you have an opening for an editor, how many of people of color are you choosing to interview? How many make it to the final round? And then when you select that person, are they making the same amount of money as the white editor that just left? So I think that it doesn't just start with finding candidates, it's actually securing them and retaining them for a long periods of time therefore having a culture that is welcoming and supportive and gives opportunities for growth so they stay and then paying them what they're worth. Um, so yeah, it's complicated, but you, you, have to, you have to start at the top. I will say that the very first question Miran asked of me uh, when she was invited to this panel is who else is gonna be on this panel? So I was like, yes. Uh, don't you worry, the representation project is fully committed, but it's so wonderful that, you know, to run into other folks who are as well. So thank you, Mirren. Um, question for you, McKinsey, that it really dovetails well with this idea of behind the scenes, right? You've worked hard for so many years to make advertising and other media content more inclusive of women athletes and, and beyond women, right? Uh, talk to us about the role that corporations can actually play in improving the amount and type of attention that women uh, and gender expansive athletes uh, receive, you know, uh, folks of color, LGBTQ+, plus, um, folks with disabilities, like what role can corporations play in shifting our culture? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you know, when we first started our recent Project Nine, which, you know, as the name suggests, uh, references what what would it look like if we applied the notion of Title Nine um, here at Google to our investment in media, in partnerships, in our own products. Um, that really, you know, got things going. But what we quickly discovered was that even if we wanted to double or triple our own investment, uh, media investment, so making sure that we were putting our media dollars, um, you know, on on you know women's sports, on the game, the important WNBA games, the NWSL, et cetera, we max we would max it out very very quickly. That just meant there were not enough games uh, on television, and we see this happen. You know, I know that a handful of folks are waking up early or staying up very late to watch um, games now and thinking about like, what is in prime time. Why is there this you know WNBA All Star game competing against uh, you know another team in the same in the same metro area for the Monday nights, you know, slot. So as we were beginning to really like push, push on this question, we just realized that since there was a dearth of content, we needed to work directly with the ESPNs, the broadcasters to increase that content. And this is where I think that, you know, corporations have a power, but also a privilege and an onus to do more here. 
Um, so really asking that question of not just you know going in and and checking the boxes very quickly, but rather you know saying, are you even considering the women's sports? Or what about um, you know not just the All Star game or the finals, but actually throughout the whole season? And I think that this you know is not just something that we will um, you know have been begun to do. I, I think this is a very long road ahead of us. And honestly, I feel like we're a li- we're certainly a bit late there too, but how can other organizations do the same? So whether that's, you know, a uh, Procter and Gamble, whether that's, you know, folks that are also outside, you know, I think we often lean on, on the Nikes and the Under Armors to do, to do this, but it's really everyone. Um, you can get, we know that you can get a ton of eyes on your content. Uh, if you just Put it out there and actually make the investment. It's not. This is not a charity. That's an investment, uh, and that you will uh, reap the benefits there. So, I would encourage you know other other corporations to think about this again as this investment as a multi-year piece as opposed to just a single one-off thing uh, here and there. And then and ask the question kind of similar to the representation within your own you know, own teams, but also thinking about every other piece of the. Um, you know, of the narrative. So whether that's your own creative, whether that's who's, um, who's on screen, who's behind the scenes, uh, if you are referencing sport, like who actually are you showing? Are you also like only showing um, black folks during sports or during music, but actually like really challenging, um, you know, the status quo there and really also challenging um, certain stereotypes that I think you know, unfortunately, a lot of, at least in the United States, that there's a lot of stereotypes that persist due to uh, mass media and, you know, media in general. So it's really continuing to to push on that, asking at every single stage, uh, continuing to ask the question, you know, per, per Maren's comment of like, who's in the room? And how do we also center those voices? So oftentimes that means also passing the mic uh, as well. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, so you're talking about corporate social responsibility and the power of corporations. Uh, and Sean, your work centers on this and it also looks at the other side of the coin, right? Uh, it looks at athletes and activism. How have athletes uh, collaborated with companies and teams in order to advance social justice? And can you speak a bit to the role you think athletes can and should play in pushing for social justice? Right, so great question. And, and, and so just to kind of go into the context of what we see now, I just want to give a brief history of, of kind of how this whole concept of, of corporate social responsibility, you know, uh, how it started. And so we, we look at the civil rights movement as sort of this grand movement, uh, mid 50s to late 60s, that sort of brought about a sweeping amount of change throughout the country. And so that's when we saw the, the rise of the Muhammad Ali's of the world and all of that. But what we sort of kind of miss out on is the fact that organizations were challenged at that point uh, to be more focused on uh, societal needs. OK, so no one was asking organizations to necessarily stop being profitable, but be ethical in that profit process. Right. And so we saw athlete activism in, in, in many ways at its height at that point, 20, 30 years later went dormant. And now we see um, athlete activism at its rise. And so what I believe has made it different from say the civil rights movement is now various amount of high profile athletes are challenging the organizations to do better, you see. Uh, because 50, 60 years ago, organizations can operate under uh, an umbrella of secrecy and bureaucracy without being called out. Now uh, that case has changed. And particularly what we see in sport organizations is that they are very reactionary. So there was not a domestic violence sort of policy in place until the NFL had to do something about that when the news came out. And so all of the other sport leagues sort of followed suit. So what does that really show us? That there was probably really no concern about this until it actually came about, right? And so now we're seeing athletes challenging organizations to help them in their mental health, right? To challenge society to be are more focused on uh, pay inequities, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of the things that we're seeing in the media now. 
Now, what's the challenge is how do we stop sport organizations from negatively reacting to say what we see on social media? Let's take into the, the account of Simone Biles, for example, and her stepping back for a second to take care of her mental health. Well, Twitter, <laughs> you know, went up in a firestorm, basically telling her, oh, you should be mentally tough. You know, and all these anonymous people, somebody with like a Winnie the Pooh <laughs> sort of, you know, screen or something like that. Some anonymous person is telling her that, you know, you should just toughen up, right? And, and suck it up, this is what you're getting paid for. Well, athletes are saying, wait, no more. You know, we are standing here, we're fighting for our rights. We're fighting for the rights of others, and we're using our powerful platforms to do that. That's what's different from what we see or what we saw, you know, at the height of the movement 50, 60 years ago. So the challenge now is how do we utilize the moment now and the ways in which these athletes are challenging these organizations to be better to create policy reform? That's the movement going forward. Thank you, Sean. Fantastic analysis, right? Institutional, systemic, behind the scenes, the importance of on the screen, the influence in our broader culture, uh, what athletes can do about it, what corporations can do about it, what newsroom editors and executives can do about it. Um, so we're gonna open it up to questions and then we will ask one last question at the end, it'll be quick, uh, but you'll notice we're moving it right along because we want to get right to your questions. Um, so someone did actually ask a question about whether or not this will be posted after the fact. It will be, uh, and I believe this is a school teacher who's going to build an assignment around this panel, and I, I don't blame you. I mean, every point uh, that I could, would want to write in a paper about the issues with this are being addressed and touched upon. It's really great. Um, so first uh, question here. Um, and why don't we throw this to Mirren um, and then to Courtney. Do you notice a difference in how women athletes are represented across various sports? If yes, what do you think influences this difference? Mirren? I think that, um, I think there's a tendency um, with WNBA players to try to and the WMA has been doing this for years, try to make them look more feminine or, you know, put them in situations where they're asked about, you know, um, their spouse or their partners or, you know, what, what fashion ads can they do? And you see that the, the women athletes, I believe that are more quote, feminine, traditional, hetero looking, um, get more endorsements and more favorable coverage. And the ones that don't the ones that I guess mainstream you know cis media finds deviant are not afforded the same coverage um I, I think like sports like swimming and volleyball you see a lot more emphasis on their bodies and their outfits and are they wearing makeup and they want them to it's this dichotomy between wanting them to wear as little clothes as possible and yet it, and then talk about them as not wearing enough clothes. It's it's this you can't win dichotomy. So um, yeah, it's it's really a shame. And I'll also just add the the journalism counterpart to this is that those of us who are writers and those of us who are sideline reporters are judged completely differently. And we are encouraged to be more sexy and more revealing. And uh, it really just does a disservice just as it does to the athletes. Oh, thank you, Maren, for that analysis. Um, Courtney, what is your take on this? Do you notice a difference in how women athletes are represented across various sports? Absolutely, uh, that's a short answer. <laughs> the longer answer is, um, I think I think many of the things that Maren brought up are true. And I think even within sports, there's a way there's this, this self-selection that happens with the media. Um, and so even in a black sport like the W, the, the ways that I see certain 
athletes that are kind of brought to the forefront when there are all of these stories to be told within the league, right? Um, I see how there is this very much a cherry picking that's racialized, that's very much about how someone presents their gender, how gender, I think there's some really interesting um, ways that the the kind of runway, the pregame runway of walking into the tunnel has allowed for a lot of freedom that I think um, allows for all different forms of gender expression that I find to be super, super interesting, right? Um, and so I think that uh, even within sport, which athletes get elevated, which athletes are promoted, that goes across sports. I'm using the W as an example, but I think that's a really interesting thing. And of course, the Olympics gives us every type of body, right? Um, and so I think that there's a way that um, that a weightlifter isn't promoted the same way as a gymnast, right? There's a ways that are just built into these hegemonic norms of femininity, of normativity, um, that privilege certain forms of athleticism as um, okay for public consumption. So volleyball is a great example of like a sport that translates really well to television that is always already kind of sexualizing the athletes that are doing incredible athletic feats, right? And so I think that when I think about how certain sports become stereotypes, right? Um, or some sports become kind of the ideal of, of who can be promoted within the sport. Um, and so when we think about who the, how superstars form, to go back to like Miran's example of like who can be featured, the things that you have to do in order to be featured and to have some kind of prominent media coverage require a lot of extra hoop jumping if you're a woman um, to have that. And so we do have exceptions to that, obviously, but I think that there's a way that um, to, to stick to merely someone's athletic feats and their philanthropy, which men get to stick to all the time, um, I I think in many ways we we haven't seen that happen where there is a consistent kind of piece there and so i think to me across sport and even within sport who gets to be the face um i think is something that that hasn't changed as much as i would hope because i think there's so many great stories that we aren't telling uh within women's sport more broadly that that are missed out because this there's still this 18 to 35 straight white male that we're trying to appeal to when we think about who watches these sports and who really supports these athletes um that's not always the target audience and, and maybe shouldn't always be uh the focus in general of, of who we're appealing to when we think about who we market sport to Ah, yes, all the untapped potential if you look at it through a market lens, right? Um, and I will say that in our Respect Your Game report, which, yes, it's now up on our website, magically timed with this panel, and everyone who's uh, viewing this live today will uh, receive a link to that report. We focus on what both Mirren and Courtney talked about, um, what has been coined the, uh, the feminine apologetic, right? This idea that because you're engaging in such a masculine endeavor, uh, that women are required on the, for example, on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazines or in their self-presentation uh, to uh, act very feminine in ways that they otherwise might not in order to kind of counterbalance that, right? Um, and what does that say about uh, how we think of athleticism, who we think of as an athlete, who we think of as a legitimate athlete, uh, how we think of gender roles and how how uh, constraining they are. Uh, and it's really incredible to see this come up against the fact that a majority of Generation Z now identifies as gender fluid in some way. And so times are a changing and we're certainly seeing more um, inclusion in terms of the quantity of coverage, but the quality, the types of coverage are still uh, incredibly gendered and intersectionally gendered and raced. And uh, someone uh, in, the, in the chat also brought up age, the obsession with age. Um, so we did get a comment. This is an amazing panel. I could not agree more anonymous attendee, incredible group of uh, thinkers here. Uh, a question for McKinsey and for Sean. Uh, let's start with you, McKinsey. Did you see any major shifts in commercials run during this year's Olympics versus past versus other major sporting events? Any trends in uh, commercials? Sure. Um, I admit that I am a, a cable cutter. So I've seen personally just a ton of, of the same probably 10 commercials again and again and again and have a group chat with other fellow uh, women's sports fans around what commercials everyone is seeing. Um, and I will say that though there's some certainly some differences uh, on cable and um, digital, what we have seen that is at least good news is that commercials that were centering and are centering um, women are getting higher returns uh, right now, both on viewers, um, obviously like further brand metrics, I think will will shift and change over time. And we we don't won't know those yet. Um, but the one thing that actually my partner and I have been talking about, and I talked about with um, someone on my team, as well has been the increase in uh, media, again, this is this is predominantly on the digital side, 
um, that is focused on, or at least centering in one way or another, um, the Latinx audience. Uh, and I, this has been a, a pleasant surprise. Um, I think that oftentimes we we seldom, um, you know, center notably the Latinx audience in, in mainstream media. And um, that's something that personally I've, I've taken, um, taken account of and we've been digging into, you know, how, how and why um, that's really, really happening. And, you know, that's, that is a, a disparity from years past, notably because we haven't actually seen um, broader investment from the Latinx community in the Olympics. So I'm curious to see kind of like the why behind this. I, I don't know this yet, but, um, but that's definitely been a, that and the, you know, the women um, representation in the ads that have been going, going well, but I'll pass it over to Sean. Great. Sean, major shifts in commercials? Yeah, so I have to piggyback off of what uh, Mackenzie said, and, and, you know, we have, we have seen shifts, you know, we've seen sort of these uh, inspirational commercials uh, that are targeted towards women and young girls that are saying, you know, hey, you have the power to be at this level yourself someday, or you can do this too, or you could do anything that you put your mind to, right? But here is where I tend to caution myself with how progress is being made, simply from the perspective of the Rule 50 that the Olympics put out, okay? So you're saying that, all right, we are trying to be respectful, we're trying to be uh, inclusive, we're trying to be equitable by broadcasting what we're trying to do to create a more just society. But then you're trying to rule on Raven Saunders's, you know, demonstration of, of intersectionality. So, okay, and you're trying to say that this could be a potential violation. But what Raven is talking about is the very same thing you're trying to promote in your commercials. So, so it's, it's, again, sport organizations could be reactionary that could kind of showcase if, if you're really trying to break it down, a little bit of confusion if they try to punish Raven for that demonstration, but then try to showcase that everyone is powerful, everyone can be as long as they put their mind to it. So, so again, there is some progress, but from the structural level, that's where we have to see that change. Thank you, Sean. And in fact, as you were uh, sharing, a uh, question came in, is there, an, is there an update on the IOC investigation of Raven Saunders' gesture on the metal stand? For folks who are unfamiliar, uh, she threw up an X and said it is the intersection of all oppressed people. Um, what is the precedent for investigating her? I'm actually not sure. I know, I know so the, when they established the rule, they were saying that, you know, the, for anyone who is on a podium who is receiving uh, you know, any, any, any sort of metal uh, would receive some, some form of punishment because you're essentially, for lack of better terms, desecrating this holy ground of the Olympics and you are uh, uh, not showcasing uh, any type of national pride for your country because you want to protest against uh, a specific thing. Now, Here's one thing that, I, that uh, I need to look up because it's, of course, held in Tokyo. You know, we have to look at the different host countries that these sports are held in and, and how uh, the political spectrum is sort of displayed in those countries because that has a lot to do with some of the things that, that, that could be displayed. So as far as how they would move on it, um, I, is, is, is pretty murky because you, what we've seen in our society is that if you engage in a peaceful protest or one that is you know, pretty substantially rowdy, you still can receive the same sort of punishment. So I'm quite sure the committee is probably trying to take a look at that and, and move with hesitation in the sense of not making society you know, upset in, when, in, in this point now in which we have all of these movements that are trying to break down barriers. So it's, it's kind of a wait and see type of game at this point. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Courtney, please jump in. 
So I just want to um, maybe just to, to kind of jump in on the current status with Raven. Um, I think it's really interesting, given everything Sean just said, um, how, how the USOPC, the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, acronyms are tough, um, how they responded in defense of Raven, which is pretty big um, given the history of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee in terms of not actually riding for their athletes. If we go back to how Gwen Berry um, was treated at the Pan American Games, even as they were also honoring Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the USOC was like, we love them, but you did the exact same thing. We have a problem, right? Um, and so uh, it's interesting that they wrote and filed a statement on behalf of Raven and said she didn't do it during the anthem, during the actual podium ceremony. It was after when everyone was taking their pictures, like everyone removed their masks to take pictures. She took that picture, right? Um, and then going back, they didn't bring this into the statement, but this this crossing of the X mirrors what Faisa Lalesa did in 2016, although that was tied to the Oromo people and the protests that were happening there. So I think it's interesting that Lalesa was not penalized by the IOC in 2016. Um, and so I think that gives a really strong case for Raven. I love her statement of like, you want to come get this medal, <laughs> come find me, right? Um, uh -huh. And so I just think, uh, I think it's an interesting move. And, and to the point of like these conflicting messages, or we want to market a certain kind of understanding of the US or what the Olympic ideals are until we are confronted with these things, right? So um, the IOC hasn't, hasn't responded that they've taken the statement from the USOPC into consideration as of like today. I don't know if there's been any newer developments since then, but I think it's a really interesting move um, in terms of a national organizing committee standing up for their athletes, which does not happen very often. There's this idea, you're embarrassing us in front of company, right? Um, and so there's very few kind of moments where, where we see this happening. So I think it's really interesting from that. And I just also wanna say, um, you know, Raven's mom passed away today. And I know we, we've talked about her a little bit, and you know she's been very upfront about all kinds of things happening so when we talk about this kind of superhuman athlete obviously she's been really a star um, at the olympics and so i also kind of want to make space the same way we talked about uh, naomi and simone of like these athletes are real people who are doing very very real things uh, and living a whole life and so i was really struck by that of her saying i need to take some time away even as she also is fighting this move so i think there's like also a duality of like the humanity of these whole people um, and life happening to them um, and and then also having to fight against these massive institutions so that's like my last piece on raven i adore her but i think that that's a a really tough kind of moment um, that that um, I hope that you know no Olympian has to experience in that way when you're at the top of your game um, and then experience like heartbreaking loss too. Mm, thank you, Dr. Cox. Um, I'm going to answer these two very last questions very quickly. The demographics of who watches the Olympics, according to the Center for Digital Future, um, there is not a significant gender gap. Uh, so women and men are watching it about the same, no gender non-conforming or uh, non-binary data. In terms of race, um, Black Americans, Latinx Americans, and white Americans watch uh, the Olympics at about the same rates, uh, slightly lower for Asian Americans. Um, so uh, a lot of what you're seeing is really just money being left on the table, as a number of the panelists have pointed out. Also, uh, Ga Gabriella asked about what can be done to help uh, women athletes choose their own outfits and not be fined for wearing shorts. Uh, can we start a campaign against uh, this sort of uh, treatment. Yes, it's called the Respect Your Game campaign. It will go on long after the Olympics. Um, we want to use social media and our platform to call that out. Uh, so please join us in that campaign anytime you see something that you either like, Respect Your Game, or you need to call out Respect Your Game, right? Um, so we're going to play just a quick uh, last uh, question game here, 30 seconds. The one thing, if you had a magic wand, what is the one thing you would change tomorrow about the coverage, uh, intersectional coverage of women in sports, participation behind the scenes, whatever it is, we've talked about a lot of different issues here. Um, so let's start with you, Dr. Anderson, Sean Anderson. I would uh, establish a quick rule as to how vitriol is spread on social media sites such as Twitter. Um, there is no excuse for the amount of people who come against those who try to fight for injustice or fight for their own self-care uh, to be lambasted of that nature. So I will establish that type of rule. Thank you, Sean. Soraya, what would you do, magic wand? 
Um, one quick magic wand thing that I would love to change is to really put some time and effort into changing and examining the rules around um, dress codes. I think so much of the media coverage and so much of the conversation ends up coming back to that anyway, that if we really um, spend some time looking at that issue, uh, resolved some of those rules, allowed athletes to make choices about what they can comfortably compete in, then we could get rid, We, you know, we could get rid of having to have that conversation every single time. Thank you. Mackenzie, what's your fix, your magic wand? Yeah, so I'd say that we all know that four-ish percent stat of uh, women's representation in of, in sport on um, in broadcast, and I would bring that up to, let's just say, 51, or we could even say 96, but dramatically, add a couple zeros, dramatically increase that. Thank you. Mirren, what is your magic wand fix? Um, I would hire more Black women as editors. Um, they remain the least group represented from the editorial position and also pay Black women and Latinx women um, equal wages to at least white women in the sports media space. Um, certainly both are lower still than white men, but we have to increase the, the pay if we want them to stay in this industry and bring others with them. Yes, thank you. And Dr. Courtney Cox, you have the last word. Uh, we have to change out the C-suite. I get to change the execs of so people that make that. I'm going to hope that a lot of the things that folks have already mentioned will happen when we change the people that make the decisions to be reflective of the sports media folks that are covered, right? If we had the percentages of, of the athletes that are represented, having that same representation at the top of the game would be fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Cox, thank you to this incredible panel. Uh, we will be sending out the report. We will be sending out uh, links to all of the social media handles for this incredible panel. Uh, and if you are watching this after the fact, all of those links will be down below. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Hashtag respect her game. And uh, let's keep the pressure on until we get social justice in women's intersectional uh, media coverage of sports. Thank you all.